Hello. The last two lectures we covered uh, monopolies and perfectly competitive markets. We talked about how markets work, uh, the market forces uh, that bring things towards equilibrium. And one of the arguments that we made, particularly for perfectly competitive markets, is that they end up being both productive and allocatively efficient. Uh, we had mentioned that monopolies are not allocatively efficient because uh, they tend to charge a higher price and produce a lower output than what would occur in the perfectly competitive market. That was just a hint of what's to come. These next two videos, we're going to be talking about uh, things broadly defined as market failures. In particular, we're going to be looking at externalities in this video and public goods in the next video. So with that in mind, why don't we get started talking about externalities? What exactly is an externality? An externality is when there is a cost or benefit conferred on a third party that is not part of the transaction. Uh, when it is a cost that is uh, put upon a third party, we call that a negative externality. When it's a benefit, we call it a positive externality. There are two kinds of externalities. There are technical externalities, something that produces the utility or the uh, technical ability of whoever, uh, of somebody to produce, to enjoy their goods or services. Pollution is a technical externality uh, because it can reduce the utility of, say, your house if you can't breathe. Uh, another kind of externality is a pecuniary externality, something that reduces or affects profit. Uh, for example, if McDonald's opens up next door to a Burger King, they impose a pecuniary externality on Burger King. Uh, it affects their profit. Economists generally ignore pecuniary externalities, and that's something we're going to do as well. We ignore them because uh, pecuniary externalities are actually a sign of a market working or can be a sign of a market working. They can be a sign of healthy competition. So we don't tend to treat them as an externality per se, although they do still play an important role. Uh, we are just going to ignore that role for now. So an externality, again, is an effect that uh, is placed on a third party who is not part of the, trans the original transaction. For example, if a factory produ pollu produces pollution, the two parties involved in the immediate transaction, let's say that this is an automobile factory, so the two parties, the buyer of the automobile and the seller of the automobile, do not bear all the costs. There's costs in the form of pollution that uh, fall on third parties, the people living around the factory. Noises can be externalities as well as smells, traffic jams, things like that. Um, an externality is when the public costs or benefits of a good uh, separate from the private. And you can see that here on the graph to the right. Uh, firms and individuals really only care about their private uh, costs. Uh, so when the two of uh, when uh, private and public costs are aligned, as they were in the perfectly competitive market, that's really not a problem. But when they separate, then we have an externality. This example of a negative externality, uh, if people only look at their private costs and private benefits, we end here at this equilibrium point E0. But if, say, there's pollution in the production, in this case of refrigerators, uh, then those costs are not taken into account. And we really, it's more ideal for the market, it's more optimal for the market to be at this point where the public costs and benefits uh, match up, this E1. So you can see real quick from this, a negative externality is a situation where the market overproduces, overproduces uh, compared to what is socially optimal. The interesting implication of this is monopoly may not in fact represent a market failure. A monopoly may not be allocatively inefficient if there are externalities presented in the market. Uh, since monopolies are output restrictors, 
uh, if there is indeed an externality, the monopoly might already be operating at the allocative, allocative, allocatively efficient point, and thus breaking up the monopoly might actually move the market away from optimum. Well, one of the other implications about this is if we have a difference between uh, public costs and private costs, or a difference in costs, there also represents a market opportunity. That's uh, largely what we have been discussing drives, drives exchange, differences in valuation, differences in costs and benefits. And uh, somebody who can close this gap between the private and the public could stand to make a lot of money. So when a market by itself does not allocate resources efficiently, if we're not allocatively uh, efficient, then uh, the extra, then we say that there is a market failure. And externalities are one such example of market failure. Other examples, like we talked about, could be a monopoly, although not necessarily, and could also be public goods. Public goods we're going to talk more about in the next video. One of the issues here is that not everything that appears to be allocatively inefficient, not everything that appears to be a market failure, is actually a market failure. We already talked one particular case with monopolies, uh, but this is more general as well. And the reason is uh, what we call transaction costs. Any externality is going to be reciprocal. What that means is that pollution, for example, in and of itself is not an externality. Pollution is only an externality if it falls on somebody else. If there's a firm producing, uh, producing in the middle of nowhere and the smoke just harmlessly dissipates, there's no externality. It's the interaction of pollution and, say, your lungs where the, uh, where the externality exists. You breathing by yourself, not an externality. The factory producing smoke by itself, not an externality. It's the interaction of the two. That's an externality. Given the fact that, the, uh, that externalities are reciprocal, they can be negotiated away. There's incentives on both sides to negotiate away this externality and to bring the private costs and the public costs into alignment with one another. But why aren't externalities always negotiated away? Pollution clearly exists, and pollution may be um, economically inefficient. So why aren't these uh, merely bargained away? Well, there are two main reasons that this can happen. One, I had mentioned already, transaction costs, and we'll come back to them. And the other are poorly defined uh, property rights. When rights are poorly defined, uh, they're not doing their job of who owns what and what can be done with that ownership, what can be done with that right. We talk about property rights being a bundle of rights, a group of, uh, of claims on what you can and cannot do with your property. You may use your car, for example, to drive virtually anywhere that you want uh, and do pretty much whatever you want with it. You can buy a car and leave it rusting in your front lawn if you want, or you can buy a car and go on a cross-country trip uh, to San Diego and back if you want. That's part of your bundle of rights. However, it is also excluded. You cannot use your car for, say, illegal activities. You can't uh, use it to be a getaway driver. You can't kill somebody with your car. So you do have ownership of your car, but this bundle of rights does not include certain things. When rights are properly defined, when it's clear who owns what and what can be done with that right, uh, transaction costs are necessarily lower, and any externality can be negotiated away. For example, uh, if the factory has the right to pollute and everybody knows that they have the right to pollute, then you could offer money in theory to get them to reduce uh, or eliminate um, pollution. Alternatively, if you have the right to free to clean air, uh, they could offer you compensation if they themselves pollute. However, when rights are not properly defined, then part of what we have to develop is who actually owns the right. If it's not clear, does the factory have the right to produce uh, pollution or do you have the right to clean air, who has the starting, uh, where's the starting point? How do we negotiate? We would have to uh, come up with that and, just, and we discover that it's very, very expensive. 
Another way that externalities aren't negotiated away is when we're dealing with transaction costs. Transaction costs are the cost of engaging in a transaction. Uh, you need to find buyers and sellers. You need to negotiate with them on price, on quantity. Uh, you need to enforce tracks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these transaction costs exist everywhere. If you're going down the road to Target, there are still transaction costs because you need to get in your car, you need to drive to Target. Uh, if the benefit of the transaction overcomes the costs, including the transaction costs, the transaction occurs. And we have lots of ways of reducing transaction costs. Money is a big one. Uh, middlemen, such as wholesalers, such as um, uh, retailers, reduce transaction costs. There are also lots of customs that we have, laws and legislation, uh, that reduce uh, transaction costs. One of the ways that legisl legislation does, that we just talked about, is enforcing and defining property rights. So if we think about uh, what we were just talking about with externalities, Externalities can be negotiated away if there are low transaction costs. And what's interesting is it doesn't matter who initially the, alloc the rights are allocated to. The optimal level of pollution uh, will eventually uh, be negotiated to. So, for example, with refrigerators here, if uh, the optimal level uh, here is $700 per refrigerator producing about 40,000, and we're currently at this point E0 here, if uh, the right to uh, produce refrigerators is given to the manufacturer, the right to pollute, we'll call it, what the people who are paying the public cost can do is they can negotiate away, they can offer the firm to cut back on production and we'll eventually get up to this point here. Likewise, if the uh, firm uh, is not granted the right to pollute, but rather everybody else is granted the right to clean air, the firm uh, would start at this point, um, this E1, and they would have no incentive to move beyond it because they would have to pay. So regardless of negotiate, regardless, we're going to get to this point, this optimal point in a world with no transaction costs. In a world with transaction costs, however, the allocation of rights do really matter. They do matter um, a lot. And so as such, that's a role of government in dealing with externalities. Governments can properly define and enforce the property rights. Uh, who gets what? And the goal here is to try and allocate the rights to where they're going to be most useful or to where they are most valued. That's a very difficult question that we ask governments and judges to do. We're going to get more into that in a uh, couple of videos when we talk about law and economics. Another role of government is to lubricate exchanges by reducing transaction costs. Uh, for example, pollution is often a difficult thing to simply negotiate away because the people who are affected by pollution are all, they can be all over a county, all over a city, all over the world depending. One thing that governments can do is uh, make it easier, lower the transaction cost by getting everybody together in one place or by appointing representatives of the people. Um, class action lawsuits uh, are an example of this. Finally, what, something that a government can do is if they can't properly define the rights and they can't reduce transaction costs far enough, they can impose a tax or a control on, on the externality, a carbon tax, for example, on carbon emissions. That way, by increasing the price, uh, they attempt to reduce uh, quantity supplied and quantity demanded, uh, and thus we get, uh, we get to an optimal level of production. There are, of course, issues with this. We'll talk about uh, the later video. Uh, but the basic idea of externalities here is there are costs or benefit and, uh, that fall on a third person. And the and big ways of overcoming these, of internalizing the costs, we call them, is by defining property rights and trying to reduce transaction costs. The next video will, uh, will cover public goods and finish up on market failure.